Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wild Your Garden. And today I'm in the far northern reaches of the UK. I'm in Aberdeenshire and I am not far from Aberdeen itself. We're probably only about 15 miles away. And I am just east of the Cairngorm Mountains, which you can probably just make out in the distance. So uh, fabulous landscape. It's a landscape of windswept beech trees. We've got gorse, broom, moorland, forest, loads and loads of forest. I mean, you can see probably just all around me, so much forest, uh, woodland. Uh, there's been long-eared owl sighted in this wood. So it's a, a fabulous place. There's just so much habitat for birds and wildlife, lots of meadows, lots of pasture everywhere. So although it's quite northerly, uh, the butterfly numbers are somewhat lesser than in the south of the UK. It's still a really, really nice spot for wildlife. And today I have come back to visit a wildlife pond that I built that is down this track. So three years ago, I built this pond. Let's go and have a look. It was one that was uh, an existing water body and it's one that we uh, looked to re-establish to really improve it for wildlife obviously first and foremost because it had got so overgrown now a lot of the problem with this pond was that the uh, the reed mace had really taken over um, just while we're here I'll show you one of these lovely windswept beech trees I mean they are just such fabulous trees I mean this is not exactly huge but that's what happens when you have uh, lots and lots of wind of course things get a bit windswept things get uh, a little bit bent double so uh, you see some really fantastic uh, Scots pine in particular and um, yeah beech and other trees which are just kind of angled over because of the wind southwesterly wind a lot of the time uh, but so really lovely to see so if I just turn around here the property is just there and it includes this small section of uh, quite old woodland now I mean this this back part of the garden has been untouched uh, for probably 50 years so really is incredible to see some of the stuff that lives in there there's some really interesting plants uh, and the trees some fabulous scots pine in there again scots pine does really well with windy sort of craggy uh, outcrop conditions you see it quite high up sometimes along with silver birch and rowan trees which do very well um, some more scots pine here you can see behind me along the driveway and yes, I sort of come back to a place like this and think how wonderful it would be to have all this wildlife and habitat on your doorstep. So it's going to be uh, good to see the pond. I'm looking forward to this. It's, uh, as I say, one that I built almost three years ago now. Um, we cleared out the existing reed mace. We, uh, there's a lot of stone on the site, hell of a lot of stone on the site, which is brilliant um, because this is a natural pond. So we created a a nice bank of stone that you could sort of sit amongst and um, get down to the edge of the pond in and create some good perches for uh, birds of course, grey wagtails in particular, which turned up the day after, well actually when, when it was being filled up they turned up again. I just thought I'd stop briefly here to show you this wild patch on the drive uh, which the uh, clients have left which is just absolutely brilliant, it's teeming, absolutely teeming with them. Um, Tufted vetch, which at the moment is uh, an absolute bee magnet. I'll put a couple of close ups of that in now for you. Got what sounds like an oyster catcher in the distance. So, for those of you that don't know the geography of Scotland, um, Aberdeen is right on the coast, the northeast coast. So, we're not too many miles inland from where we are here. So, it's really nice to see. Um, I feel terrible. I've just scared the birds off. There's a feeder here, which um, as I pulled up earlier, there was a, a male siskin uh, sat on the ground there. Siskins, of course, not something that I see uh, in the east of England very often. Uh, they prefer uh, coniferous forests and uh, just in general woodland, uh, woodland bird. Um, great population of house sparrows and tree sparrows here, but primarily tree sparrows, which is a real treat because I don't get to see many of them. So oh, there's one, if you can see just there, sat on the roof. And all these boxes are actually occupied. I think there are about 11 pairs, I believe, uh, the, the client said, that are actually using these boxes. So 
a nice healthy population of tree sparrows which is wonderful to hear I mean tree sparrows aren't common by a long shot so uh, oh, the siskin actually just flown up into the trees so I'm walking towards the pond there was actually an area next to the pond where there was a section of meadow created as well so if I turn around now let's have a look at how it's doing so here we have the wildlife pond it's quite low at the moment it's uh, the middle of June you might not think it given the the sky although this is a bit more like a Scottish summer I suppose uh, even though I've got a jacket and a jumper on um, it's still nice to see this so the, the broadleaf pondweed as you can see has really filled in to uh, plug the gap uh, on the surface so for a, a surface for floating leaf plant that's brilliant um, here are you can just see some of the massive boulders that I used a big digger to uh, put in place and some of the stone that we put in towards the edges. Uh, there's a bit of a blanket weed uh, build up where the pond level has dropped a reasonable amount. As I say this pond is not lined um, so it's one of the ponds that is just natural. Uh, obviously the ground is very wet here through a lot of the season and so uh, it's really really good to uh, to see this pond still holding a lot of water even though it's been uh, quite warm of late. So. The water level does come up above a lot of these rocks in the winter time which is really nice to see uh, but things doing very well that was the um, the bulrushes at the back that uh, had encroached um, I'll put a picture in now of how it looks before that I mean you literally couldn't see any water body so uh, there was an excavator used to dredge out all of the well not all obviously but a lot of the reed mace um, out of there which was uh, then going to make way for a lot more water body and a lot more habitat of course and that reed mace was tipped over there which uh, made a bit of a mound luckily there's a bit of space on site so used a dumper to tip it over there and uh, that has uh, consequently grown back uh, it's used just growing in the sort of damp silty soils over there which is fine but at least it's not in the pond clogging the pond up so um, bit of a bad year this year so far for uh, a lot of the odonata species dragonflies damselflies so things very very late because of the cold um, april we had i believe up here in scotland uh, a boy in the nearest town um, there were frosts of 25 of the 30 nights in April and probably the other five nights were about maybe one degree above freezing so April very very cold which put everything back that's why it's been so late uh, coming into fruition this year however we have got some things to show you so let's have a look at what sort of plants are in the pond uh, or around the margins so the margins if I get down these steps without breaking my neck um, so if I crouch down now you can see we've got things like this water plantain still doing uh, very well there have been a lot of um, emergencies of, of bog bean that's doing really well that was planted along the margins uh, there are uh, some carrots acutiformis some lesser pond sedge which is making a really nice um, foliage uh, block of foliage back there cover for um, you know a lot of stuff and uh, we've got things like the rag, ragged robin which you can probably just see and uh, things looking really good down the far end I'm not going to go all the way down there because uh, we'll come on to the meadow in a moment there's no path through there at this point in time and I don't want to tread on all the, the wildflowers that are coming up but uh, there's some flag iris yellow flag iris just there that you can see that's coming up uh, and in general and we've got things like this um, purple loose strife as well which is uh, yeah I mean back down in the southeast of England uh, these things are uh, near in flowering now but uh, obviously this is a fair way off flowering yet a good couple of weeks behind at least um, let's have a look at this yellow iris there's one here as well actually which has done nicely that's yellow flag iris um, yellow flag iris really really good obviously a native plant they tend to be better for um, bigger water bodies I find just because they can create quite a big clump so if you're looking to do a wildlife pond or make one then just be warned yellow flag iris can create a, a six foot clump no problem at all over the course of a few years um, and actually this is a nice one sorry I've just seen next to me here we've got some water avens which I did plant which is doing very well this is lovely lovely flower uh, these sort of apricot coloured bells 
lot of time. Um, really nice, good one for bees. Bit of broadleaf dock coming up, but uh, I'm sure that can get taken out. But it's a really nice plant. Water avian's great for a damp margin around the edge of a pond. Um, really, really good. So I'll show you actually a bit of the broadleaf pond weed up close. You can see where it has been um, growing on, on well, when the water's been up, it's been obviously growing at a higher level, uh, but um, it's just now dropped a little bit. But you can see this broadleaf pond weed doing very, very well. And uh, has actually, if I turn around, um, if I fall in the pond, then uh, you'll have a good laugh. So this is all broadleaf pond weed. So it's done really, really well at creating a nice carpet, which is going to keep the water levels down, keep them cool, and help prevent the spread of blanket weed. Of course, blanket weed loves really kind of warm, uh, shallow margins in which it can breed. So um, broadleaf pond weed is good for creating a, a, a surface coverage, if you like, and you always want 60 to 70 percent water surface coverage, if you can, of the. Uh, of the floating leaf plants. Things like fringed water lily you'll have heard me speak about as well but this is just brilliant. I can't believe how well that's done in three years. I mean um, it wasn't planted out there. Uh, a few lilies were put in. Uh, you can perhaps make out maybe one or two darker patches of native water lilies, slightly bigger lily. Um, while I'm here, a bit of an exciting project coming up on this garden. We've got this area behind me here, I come away a little bit. Uh, yeah, this area here is going to be um, a bespoke, shall we say, uh, bird hide, which uh, the clients really, they're, they're, they've worked with birds for oh, decades and uh, they're both qualified ringers. They spend a lot of time each year monitoring birds. So we thought it only fitting that they had somewhere where they could watch the birds and say they get yellow, uh, gray wagtail here, regularly on the pond, which is really nice to see, along with a lot of other birds as well. Uh, there's a male siskin here as well earlier on today. So that's gonna be a really nice sort of glass fronted bird hide um, with a sedum roof and a bit of planning to do yet, but um, keep your eye on the channel for that one. That's gonna be coming up in the next year, hopefully, once I get back here up to the beautiful land of Scotland. Um, got one or two more projects coming up in Scotland actually, which will be nice to, uh, to have a look at. So. Let's take a look now at the meadow, shall we? If I spin you round, this area was all just basically lawn. Um, not much in it, not much of any merit. It was stripped off, uh, and then obviously all the uh, the subsoils underneath were then sown, uh, rotated, and sown with wildflowers. And the results are really, really starting to come through now. I'll get down here first. I've got things like my favourite wildflower, the bird's foot trefoil which is of course the larval food plant of the common blue butterfly uh, doing really really well, that's spreading nicely. We've got lots of red clover which is um, really really good and um, if you haven't seen my video of white clover, red clover then do check that out. Um, that is uh, certainly one you should be putting in your lawns and helping the bees out that's for sure. So we've got a bit more ragged robin growing in the meadow that's doing really really well now. Seems to be spreading year on year. We've got more buttercups which are yeah looking fabulous now. They've sort of gone over in the southeast of the country but uh, and we've also got a cracking little wildflower I like which is this orange fox and cubs which uh, yeah really really good. Just You see them often in lawns they do look fantastic. Got a bit of cow parsley that's sprung up but that's fine. Lots more uh, tufted vetch which is really really good for bees. We've got some uh, rest tarot in the middle there, which is a kind of a semi woody shrub, but really, really good again, a, a vetch like flower. And uh, let's take a wander to the other end so you can have a look. We've got some rose bay willow herb there, which is a larval food plant for the elephant hawk moth. And that apparently was covered in lava or larvae um, over the last, uh, last year, so uh, really nice to see that. Yeah, lots more vetch as you can see down here. Looking really, really nice, covered in bees. Even on an overcast today, you'll be amazed how much bees uh, will be. I've got a common carder bee just down there. You might be able to see it if it flies. I hope he's enjoying the nectar too much. Oh yeah, he's just flown over there. So 
lots of bees already using this meadow and of course have been for the last year or two meadows do take a bit of a while to establish so don't expect amazing results within the first year they, they generally take a couple of seasons to start settling and for things to start growing uh, we've got some ox eyes coming up as well i love this cow parsley it's actually such a beautiful little flower and um yeah a lot of hoverflies and things will use that of course hoverflies are a key uh, key pollinator they um, pollinate a lot of plants I know we go on about bees and butterflies, but you know, moths, hoverflies, uh, even flies and beetles as well. Beetles are a big pollinator of a lot of plants. So we've got some meadow sweet over there growing, um, which is kind of coming into the edge or going in from the meadow into the edge of the uh, pond area. We've got more meadow sweet over there. Um, things looking really, really nice. We had a lot of marsh marigolds apparently earlier on in the year, which have now uh, gone over. But uh, yeah, things are really settling in well. So this meadow will get a cut in the autumn time in September. And um, yeah, the, the clients have been too uh, too scared to lose habitat to mow a path through here. So they've been very, um, very selfless in, uh, <laughs> in not mowing a path, apart from the edge where I've just walked along um, simply for access. But, uh, and then we go off into what is this fabulous habitat behind me, um, which is just a, in fact, you know what, if you've got a minute, I'll show you, because this is a habitat to die for, I promise you. This is what happens when you, yeah, this is what happens when you don't touch an area for 50 years. And I mean, the wet, boggy stuff that's around the back of here is just incredible. I'm kind of going through this undergrowth, and I mean, we've got these lovely, it's an old, old rowan that's died, standing deadwood, vital habitat for so much stuff beetles insects these lovely mature scots pines which are just fabulous um, some stumps with some ferns ferns growing everywhere of course ferns love a damp shady setting and we've got along the back here some gorse just coming into flower it's funny on the way up here there's gorse in full flower all all across the the landscape it seemed but um some of it is held back but it is a bit cooler so i'll just show you this little woodland dell behind me which oh, it's just gorgeous so peaceful uh, and actually it's on the back of the pond which you can probably tell because a lot of the uh the reed mason things in here uh, the pond comes right out in the winter time it comes almost up to where i'm standing um Back there we've got a lot of angelica just naturalized itself over the years these lovely goat willows which are just really old kind of relic goat willows that are quite old now um, and um, yeah there's just so much stuff in here the mosses look at the moss it's just untouched for decades literally decades in here uh, and actually there's some sphagnum moss which again is absolutely vital in uh, retaining the moisture in the moorland to you know and all the peat and everything retaining the carbon so they are a really key component for a lot of moorland habitats of course um, and I forget there's this little white flower that I've never seen before in my life which uh, the client has told me she's a very good botanist and uh, it's absolutely gorgeous it's a bit like wood anemone um, I'll put the name in now because <laughs> I can't remember what it is but um, it's absolutely beautiful and this is an indicator of ancient woodland you can see it's sort of spreading away behind me um, and this area has been untouched for decades so hats off to the clients for this one this is really just such an incredible little area I mean there's, there's sort of pockets of um, birch trees which have just been left and this magnificent co-dominant I think it's co-dominant I don't think it's a single stemmed yeah this magnificent co-dominant Scots pine which is just huge as you can see which just towers away up into the air a good 50 foot they just oh man amazing to see and a, a good indicator in fact of the quality of the air 
is often by the presence of lichens and mosses. So, as you can imagine, being in almost the middle of nowhere in Scotland, take a look at these lovely lichens on this bark of this Scots pine tree. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And they are yeah, growing here because the air clarity is very, very good, less pollution, so uh, a better habitat for them to grow and establish, of course. I could spend all day in here. It's just, <laughs> just the moss, you know, it's just, I mean, it's a bit dry at the moment, but normally this is quite damp and spongy. It's quite uh, strange walking on it. I'm trying to make as little impact as possible in showing you this, but uh, yeah, I just thought you'd want to see that habitat. I mean, it's something that I've, well, certainly never seen in the back garden. I've seen it on moorland walks and things, but just to have this in a back garden that is just, you know, uh, an incredible resource. There's no doubt so many birds and things that drop in through here. In fact, I've just seen a, there's a dead, uh, point to the right one. I think it's that one, <laughs> a dead silver birch. Um, no, not that one, sorry. It's this one. With that, it's just peppered in woodpecker holes, great spotted woodpecker. Um, so there's obviously a lot of bird activity in here, which they're never gonna see, but that's, that's the whole point of it. They've got natural areas for wildlife. So really, really brilliant. Again, this is the back of the pond. You can see behind me here. So the pond is just over my shoulder, uh, the area that was cleared out. Um, really fabulous, really, really fabulous. So I'm going to head round back to the pond so that you can see. There's a bit of an overview as to what has been created. But it's just, a, you know, an amazing opportunity to show you guys how the natural world can re repair itself, you know, how it can, um, you know, repopulate with uh, plants and wildlife and how quick nature is to adapt and actually thrive once again if it's left. You know, I mean, look at this. Just I'm walking back to the pond here, we've got Angelica, a uh, lovely wet loving plant. A little bit like hogweed, if you know it, but uh, a very nice native. And um, yeah, just, just the, the way in which nature can recolonize itself, repopulate itself, is absolutely fantastic. And I'm very, very pleased to have been able to have the opportunity to visit this garden again. Of course, unfortunately with my work a lot of the time, I don't get a chance to come back and see the gardens I make, so this is very nice. However, that is a nice sized pond, I'd say. Again, the rocks you can see that were put in with a digger, and over there, and over there. It's just wonderful, really nice to see. So I hope that's given you guys a bit of an insight as to a little bit about what I do, if you haven't seen already, and also how these habitats are beneficial for wildlife, the kind of plants that you can get around the edges of a pond in a wildflower meadow, and just the amazing amount of wildlife that can be attracted to a relatively small area. This area is probably only an acre, you know, maybe a little bit more. Um, but we don't have to have that. You know, my message for today is you don't need vast acres to make a haven for wildlife or create a sanctuary for wildlife, shall we say. So. Hopefully this has given you some inspiration to go out and make yourself a little wildlife pond, have a go at a wildflower meadow. If you do nothing else, put your mower away, see what comes up in your lawn. And if you don't have a lawn, get some pollinated plants in a pot, things like uh, salvias, verbena, banariensis, lavenders, that sort of thing. You really can make a difference. Even if you've just got a balcony on the, uh, or halfway up a, a block of flats, you really can still make a difference to the insects of the world, which without them, we wouldn't be here. So. Thanks very much for watching guys, really appreciate it and uh, feel free to give the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Stay tuned, more projects on this garden to come in future videos and uh, I'll see you soon. Cheers.